Welcome to Conversations in a Vintage Shop, a podcast from behind my counter between customers. Join me while I sit behind my retail counter and just have a conversation with you or with myself. While I look out the window, observe what I see, things that are happening in the store today, throughout the week, and just fun little stories that I have from my time as a business owner. This is something that you find interesting, and keep listening, and I appreciate you. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Conversations in a Vintage Shop podcast where I bring conversations that I have with customers, friends, people I meet in the shop to you. And since it's October and this will be my only episode in October, I thought it would be fun to revisit one of my very first episodes I did when I started the podcast, and that is Tales from a Haunted Vintage Shop. Now, if you haven't heard that episode, I would go back and listen to it. A lot more in-depth stories than what I'm going to talk about today. But I go over all of my experiences, paranormal, weird, odd, that I've had in the shop and other stories and experiences that people have had in the building that my shop is housed in. Now, I'm going to briefly go through all of those previous stories for those of you who haven't heard that episode or maybe need a refresher, but I might just add on a few more experiences that I've had since then. That it's spooky season, my favorite time of the year, where it's socially acceptable to love weird, macabre, and scary things. <laughs> so if that is something that interests you, stay tuned. into those stories. I'm going to pick up on the last episode, which was what I wanted Julian's auctions part two, Hollywood and royalty. Now I am recording this on October 6th and yesterday, October 5th is when I received all of my winnings from Julian's. Now I kind of start this little ritual when I receive these pieces, I can't open the box until I'm in the right frame of mind. Because I just, I don't, it's hard to explain, but these pieces are so important to me. I want to have a clear head. I don't want to have any bullshit that's happened during the day or things that are stressing me out, filter in and ruin my experience opening these amazing pieces of history. So I got all of these in at the beginning of the day yesterday, and I waited until close to when I closed the shop at six to open them. And they were just sitting right next to me, waiting patiently. And I have to say, it it's interesting how objects, their inanimate objects, can hold so much importance and value because of the people who wore them and the experiences that the people who wore them I feel embossed in them. Now, I would hope that if you're listening to this episode, you listened to that one. But if you didn't, I won two pieces from Elizabeth Taylor's estate, owned and worn pieces. And I won a skirt that was worn by Natasha Natasha Leone in the 1999 film, But I'm a Cheerleader. If you want to know more information about those, listen to the previous episode, or you can head over to my shop website, and in there I have a section called the archive, where it goes over all of the information about these pieces and why they're so significant. As always, if I remember, I will put the link in the description below. (laughs) But I was really excited, and I love the ritual of framing my Julian's cards And the lot tickets that you get with them, everything's packaged so well. I'm going to be uploading a video today to all of our social medias, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, kind of giving a little bit of a preview of the box and what it looks like, 
when you receive them. So if you're interested in that, head over to our socials. We have those linked down below as well. But I'm really hoping that I can bring more of these stories to Fargo, North Dakota, and get people in this area to appreciate the fact that these were worn and owned by people who had significant roles in not just film history, screen history, entertainment, but history itself. As I talked about with Elizabeth Taylor, she really brought the AIDS epidemic out of this safe of taboo. And because of her, and I really do feel this, and and those who have written about her and her fight with, with government and trying to get them to recognize this as a crisis, I do believe that's why those who have AIDS are no longer sentenced to to de- I mean to death with this diagnosis. They can live a long life with the right medications and treatment. So I really encourage you to listen to that episode. Head on over to our archive, learn more about it. And I'm very excited. And I really, really hope that one day I can open this up and have an actual little museum where people can come in, look at these pieces, not just see them on a screen, but physically see them in person and feel them in person. That is my goal. And oh, I really hope I can get that to fruition. We did start a Patreon for this archive. Admittedly, I haven't really done much with it. But the goal for that was to raise money to get better display cases for these, possibly eventually become a nonprofit where we can get these into education systems and just spread the good word of fashion and history. Again, you can check it out on our website. I won't go on a long spiel, but I was very excited and I have to give you an update that yes, I did receive them and I could not be more excited. (laughs) Ooh, I took a little bit of a break there and had a sip of my tea, and I forgot that it was really hot, so I scalded my tongue. <laughs> so I hope as I record this, I don't slowly start to get all tongue-tied and slur my words because my tongue feels like it's going to fall out of my mouth. So just a warning for drinking tea, just be very careful. <laughs> so... Back in the episode in season one, I briefly give a little bit of history about the building that my shop is in and kind of where we got to where we are with all of the paranormal happenings and stories that I had heard honestly since I was a kid about this building. So the building that my shop, Carmen and Heworth Vintage, is located in is called Delandersee's Department Store. And we just right now call it Block 6 or the Delandersee's Building. Now, this building was Fargo's first department store, and it was built in 1894, and then it had a vertical edition in 1904. So this building now, as it stands in 2023, is a mixed-use building. You have apartments on the top floors, and you have businesses and commercial um, tenants on the second bottom and basement floors. And it's been that way for a while. Now, this block has seen a lot of transitioning. My space was built a little bit later on, but it is still attached. It had been a couple of different cafes and restaurants throughout its time. I found pictures of what my shop space used to look like in the 1940s when it was a really cool cafe, and you can see some of the same fixtures. So this building is really old. You had people who lived here, worked here, Through some of my sourcing for my shop, I've met multiple people who had their businesses in this uh, building in the 50s and 60s. So it's a really cool historic building that has so far, knock on wood, been untouched by gentrification. And there are a lot of elements of it that are still exactly as it was when it was first built, which is really cool and I feel is becoming rare and rare. Now, one of the stories that I like to connect to this building and the possible hauntings 
which I'll get into, is to the west of our building, there was this great grand hotel called the Waldorf Hotel that was built in 1899. Now, this lot had been vacant since it had been destroyed by fire in 1885. And I'm finding all of this information on the NDSU Library Archives, really great site if you live in Fargo. So the first hotel, it was the first hotel in North Dakota with an electric elevator. The Delandrecy building, who at the time had a department store to the east, put up most of the capital for this hotel. Now, through its years, it had been the Waldorf Hotel, and then it finally became, I think it was the Milnor Hotel, and then eventually the Earl Hotel. Now, a couple of cool little bits of trivia. The Waldorf Hotel, which is what it was when it was first built, there is a postcard from, I believe it was 1911. It was sometime early in the 1900s that is actually in the collection and archives of the Metropolitan Museum, which I thought was really cool. Also, it had housed a lot of big celebrities at the time who were passing through Fargo. The most notably was former President Theodore Roosevelt, who did a speech from the balcony of this building when he was on his tour of the United States. And if you see pictures of this building, it definitely, it's a large, grand brick structure. Really, really cool. Really beautiful. But sadly, not a lot of people know anything about it. (laughs) Now, I'd mentioned earlier that in 1885, there was the Sherman House Hotel that was destroyed by fire. Now, if you fast forward all the way to when eventually became the Earl Hotel, and it was also attached to what was called the Waldorf Tavern or Bar, it was destroyed by another fire on December 13th of 1951, and three people died in that fire. Now, the three people who passed, from what I read in the archives, and they show photos of the the devastation, the fire, the destruction. I mean, this was a massive structure. They brought all of the tenants and the victims over into the Delandrecy's building. They had scaffolding and walkways getting from the fire and the building, the Earl Hotel, over to our building, the Delandrecy's building, and three people did die from their injuries. Now, some have said it with this building, some of the hauntings could be related to the three people who passed. I mean, we really don't know. And in the history of our building, since it was built in 1895, it's safe to assume that a lot of people, whether they lived here or not, probably died on or near the premises. But some of the stories that have swirled around, is there's the tale of a, a lady in gray who they feel is the protector of this building and people have recorded reported seeing her walking the hallways there's one story that you see pop up online about a restaurant that used to be in our building in the basement level called the vip room and it was said that when they did some renovations on that space someone saw this woman in gray pointing to a spot on the floor and this happened several times and when they eventually dug in that spot they found really old gold coins now i've never been able to verify that i don't know anybody who has but it is a pretty cool story (laughs) and there are um building caretakers and tenants who have said that they've experienced some really creepy things in this building I mean, like I said, this building, I think, was most recently updated. It had had updates in the 70s, 80s, 90s, but it's by no means a brand new building. So there are certain halls, corridors, spaces in this building that are creepy and maybe a little off-putting. When I first had my shop in this building, it was in a tiny, tiny little two-room corner space in the basement no windows a tiny little door with a very sliver window next to it and there was what i thought was a broom closet when i first moved in so i thought okay i'll put a bunch of my storage in there 
And I opened the door and it went inside the walls. You open it and it was out of a horror movie. Cobwebs, dark, bricks, dust. It was walking through the walls, basically. And eventually, I feel like they might have filled that in in the past few years. I'm not positive, but it was really creepy. And you could hear things in the walls. But being that it's an old building, it could have been anything, honestly. It could have been birds, mice, who knows. (laughs) I mean, but really, it's not something that's talked about a lot in the building unless you've experienced something. Now, when I was in that tiny little space downstairs and I had my shop down there, I never really felt anything weird. It would be creepy on weekends and nights when other businesses were closed and I was the only one open, you walk out my door and there's this large, beautiful atrium, this, I always call it the grand staircase, that looks all the way up to a skylight in the very top floor of the building. And you have this, I call it elevator music, but, you know, old classic top 40 music playing. It can be very creepy. (laughs) Very creepy. But I don't ever recall experiencing anything when I was in the basement that made me feel scared. Other than the fact that the bathroom smelled horrendous and were disgusting. And they still smell horrendous. They're not as disgusting. (laughs) But when I moved to my shop space upstairs, that's when... I first started to notice things in my first year here. I opened in this brick and mortar space in February of 2020, a month and a half before the COVID-19 shutdown. During the shutdown, I would come here, do work, operate as if I was a normal business, which was anything but normal at that time. And things went on as they normally do. Now, flash forward to when we finally reopened in June, the store starts gaining momentum. I start getting customers in, you know, you work with people, you make friends. And in the fall and winter, I had a few things that happened that made me pause. And the first was one night I was closing and in the winter in Fargo, it gets dark out very early. And I usually close at six, but this time I think it started getting dark around five. So by the time at six, when I closed, it was pitch black outside. So pitch black that sometimes if someone has their face pressed up against my window and is staring in, I can't see them and it scares the shit out of me. And that happens all the time. Still does. So I had just locked up. I was getting stuff ready. I was at my counter counting out my register, doing what I need to do. And I look up and I notice one of my card racks that is across the shop from me spinning. Now it's not just slowly moving. It's fully rotating as if, I mean, really someone is turning it around. It, there was no air on. We didn't have the heat on at that time. No one was walking near it. I was on the other side of the shop and it was fully rotating at a speed that was extremely noticeable and unnerving. (laughs) So I walked up to it and I stopped it. And it didn't move after that. And that really creeped me out because when I was in college, I worked at a boutique that was right next door to where my shop space is now. It's not part of the Delandrecy's building, but it's a space that was built in the early 1900s. So it's very old. And I was working in the dark. It was dark outside one night. I had just closed. I was dusting. I was organizing two of our sunglasses racks. And I noticed that there was a pair of sunglasses at the top that had been sold And I went back to go grab a pair to restock it. And when I got back, that space was already filled. And I thought, okay, well, maybe it was another spot on this rack on the top. I spun both racks around. None of the sunglasses had been moved or had been empty. But I look and there 
was an empty space second from the bottom row, which there wasn't before because I would fully rotate the racks, count how many I, I needed. At the time, we color-coded them because we were really anal about that. So I knew that that space wasn't empty. It was the top space, and that freaked me the hell out. And that space was really creepy. I still have nightmares about the basement. For anybody who had ever been there, it was called One World Imports. And my former coworkers, I feel like, can vouch for the fact that that basement was one of those where if you had to go downstairs, you turned the lights on, grabbed what you needed, and you bolted up those stairs like you were on fire. You know that feeling where you feel like something's behind you when you go up a staircase, so you quickly run? That is exactly how all of us felt every single time we came up from that basement. <laughs> so this felt very personal to me. So that happened. I told a couple people about it. They thought, oh, well, maybe you just, maybe the floor was uneven and it started spinning. And I thought, okay, whatever. Yeah. Gravity. I'll buy it. That's fine. <laughs> All right, I just turned my shop music on so you might hear that faintly in the background. But another experience that I had not long after that, I had two friends in the shop. And again, it was at night. It was pitch black out. We were all towards the front of the store. And for those who haven't been in my shop, I don't have a typical cash register or phone. I just have a regular cordless phone that has, you know, a digital ring. I have a square POS system, little swivel stand. I don't have a cash drawer that pops out with every uh, transaction. So we were all talking up front and towards the back of the shop, we could hear some papers rustling. And I had one of my friends ask me, oh, is someone back there? Is Charles back there, who's my partner? And I said, no, it's just us. We listen, and all of a sudden we hear what sounds sounded to me like an old cash register open. But one of my friends said it sounded almost like a rotary phone ringing. But it was that loud, clunky, ka-ching. And there's nothing in my back room that would ever make that noise. I don't have electronics back there. I have my internet box, but that's it. I don't have TVs. I had my desk and my archive, so just a bunch of clothing and things you'd find on a desk. Scissors, stapler, stuff like that. And the look on my friends' faces when they heard that freaked all of us out. Because there was n no, nowhere that that sound would have come from. And it was loud and distinct. And it even kind of had a little bit of an echo. So it was lo too loud to be a recording. And it was prominent enough to where my friends were definitely creeped out. And wanted to leave. <laughs> and I went back and I didn't see anything at all. And I've never been able to find out what that was. Again, I don't have instruments back there. I don't have, I don't have anything that could have produced that noise. But aside from that, I mean, I've had little things happen in the shop where I'll hear papers rustling in back and I'll go in back and nothing's askew, nothing had fallen, just little things like that. There are some nights where I hear the back, like my back shop door open and I'll walk back there and there's nothing. It's still closed. Nothing has been moved. So those are things that happen pretty regularly to the point where I don't hear it anymore. Again, when I have people in the store or friends in the store and they hear it, it, I don't even, it doesn't register to me because I'm so used to it. So sometimes when you're here during the day or at night, you may hear papers rustling in back, may hear movement back there, the door shut, and no, it's no one back there. It's something that I cannot yet explain. <laughs> So 
So one of the stories that freaked me out the most happened, oh gosh, was it over the summer of this past spring? I think it might've been this past spring. And I know I brought it up in a later episode. So those who know me know that I don't like public bathrooms. I've never liked public bathrooms. I don't know why. It's, I have bathroom anxiety, really bad bathroom anxiety. Now you add that on to going into a public bathroom and people being in it, like, no, I will hold it. I can't, I can't go to the bathroom when there's someone sitting right next to me. I just can't do it. <laughs> it's, it's a weird anxiety phobia. And with the bathroom on the floor that my shop is on, it's only two stalls. It's really small. So when there are people in there, you know it. I mean, it's not very big. And one night I was working late. I, it was after close. Usually a lot of the people in the building are gone by that point in time, especially on my side of the building. And the businesses around me weren't open. So as far as I knew, I was the only one up there. And this bathroom doesn't get used a whole lot at night. And the doors are locked and you can only get in with a key. So I really had to go to the bathroom. I knew I was going to be there working later and I couldn't hold it. So I went. The door was locked, the light was shut off, and I thought, okay, I think it's safe for me to use this. So I go in, I lock the door behind me, the main bathroom door behind me, and I go into the stall, and I slowly just get myself in the zone. And next to me, all of a sudden, I hear the shuffling of feet and wait on the toilet seat and it startled the hell out of me because I swear no one was in there but I thought well maybe I just missed them and they were just really quiet and so for the next couple minutes I heard rustling in the store in the stall next to me shuffling noises that you would hear if someone was going to the bathroom in the stall next to you and I could hear someone going to the bathroom I could hear peeing (laughs) <laughs> and so I'm waiting, waiting, hoping that, okay, hurry up. I can't go to the bathroom until you leave. And I wait, and I wait, and I wait. And 10 minutes go, goes by, and not, I don't hear anything. I don't hear them get up. I don't hear them leave. And I thought, ah, oh, this is fucking ridiculous. I look under the stall, and I don't see any feet. And I didn't hear anybody get out of the stall these are old stalls. I didn't hear anybody unlock the door to leave. So I come out of my stall and I look in the next one and the door's wide open. There's no one in there. I check the door. The door's still locked. And at that point, I was like, I'm too afraid to go to the bathroom right now. I don't know where that sound came from. There wasn't anyone in the men's bathroom that's across the hall. And I've been in the women's bathroom when men have been in the men's bathroom across the hall. And you can't hear things like that that clearly at all. But that door was also locked and the lights were off. So there wasn't even anybody in there. So I get back into the shop and my partner was here working at the time too. And I tell him what happened. I asked, did you come down to the bathroom at all? even though there's only one key, so he couldn't have gotten in anyways. And he said, no, I've been in the shop. I haven't seen anyone. So I dubbed this the the phantom pisser. Now, for a while after that, I didn't use the bathroom upstairs, especially at night. It's a long, dark hall that has flickering lights, no windows. It's very, very creepy on its own. But then this past summer, I got the courage to go back in again It was another late night I was working and I had to go to the bathroom. I go in there, lock the door behind me, check all the stalls this time. No one's in them. Go go in the stall, do what I need to do. And I start hearing the exact same noises next to me again. But this time it was shorter and I heard shuffling next to me instead. And I immediately got up and looked in that stall and there was no one there. 
So that's something that has been happening still, but that I've gotten used to. It's still unnerving and still creepy. (laughs) But the Phantom Pisser has been my most recent one. Again, I still get things like paper shuffling, hearing my door and back, little things like that. Things that, again, you just don't pay as much attention to. There was recently, now that I think about it, and again, this happens so often that it doesn't phase me anymore. (laughs) But my dressing rooms, I normally, they're all curtain dressing rooms, and I keep a side of each curtain locked so that when people want to go in to try things on, they have to ask me to unlock them and they get access to the full curtain. Now, some days I do accidentally forget to lock them. So people will come in and out on their own. And there was a night where I thought I was the only one in the shop. Everybody that I had seen in the shop had left. And I heard a little bit of clanking around and movement in one of the dressing rooms. And it startled me. I thought, oh, geez, I guess someone must have slipped in there without me noticing, which has happened before. That's happened a lot. So I thought I'll give them a chance to wrap up. I wait. I wait. 45 minutes goes by. I don't hear anything. No one comes out. And I go up to the dressing room and I just say, excuse me, is anyone in there? And I don't hear anything. And I open it. And there was no one in there. There hadn't been anyone in there. So again, it's a lot of experiences like that that I have. But nothing malicious or disruptive. Just little things that remind me that this building has had a lot of history and had a lot of people come in and out of it that loved this space and this giant, beautiful, historic building as much as I do. But it's it's kind of fun having these stories. I mean, it's history. Buildings see so much. And I know it's a building, it's brick, it's mortar. But just think of all of the things that have happened in this building and around it. I do often get people asking me if I ever think any of the clothing or pieces that I get in could ever be haunted. And normally I would say no until I got in over the summer a large lot of antique Victorian and Edwardian clothing. Now, again, I haven't had anything happen necessarily with those. I know sometimes I'll have the pieces, they're all in acid-free tissue paper. I'll have them stacked up, maybe two or three pieces. And every once in a while, they'll, they'll fall down. But I just figure it's gravity. But I don't ever recall having anything happen that has been tied to any object I've ever gotten in the shop. I know I've had people tell me they think it's because I have a real Ouija board in the shop that's old. I use it in my Halloween window displays. And I have some people that get very freaked out and won't come in my shop in the month of October because they see my Ouija board in the front window and it makes them really uncomfortable. <laughs> so you really, I, you know, I never know. Maybe some of the things I brought in my shop have brought something along with it. Or maybe it's just previous tenants or business owners that are just checking in on the building, lending their support or giving a sign that you're not alone. We're here and we're watching out for you. I don't know. It's kind of romantic to think about. People who love this building so much that even in death, they come back just to see it once in a while. 
And I should mention that when a lot of these instances were happening, the really big bulk of them happened around the time where they were doing some pretty extensive renovations in the lower level of this building where there was a restaurant and it's now a wine cellar. And because of a lot of the things that were going on with the construction, things were being done improperly. It was it was really a mess and disheartening to see some of the disrespect that was happening to the building by people who were working on it and who were overseeing a lot of the renovation that was happening. And there are some of us, some myself and some other tenants, who think maybe there are spirits in this building. They were getting very upset about what was happening. And they were letting some of us know. I don't know. I mean, anything's possible. But now I don't feel creeped out in certain places of the building as much as I used to. I don't feel as creeped out in the bathroom. Bathroom still smells funky all the time. And that's the extent of it. But it's always fun checking back in and seeing if there are any other experiences and even talking to some tenants now, some haven't ever had anything happen that have made them pause. So here's hoping I would like maybe a little more friendly experiences. Only time will tell. And maybe there might be a part three in the future. (laughs) As I said earlier, this will be my only episode for October. As we go into the holiday season, things are going to start getting a little hectic and stressful. So I'm not sure how many more episodes I'll be uploading in 2023. I have another idea for another one. That may be my last episode of the year. We'll see. Sometimes I just come up with ideas that I want to talk about. But I thank you for popping in today. And on all the previous episodes this past year and season. And I love I love doing this. I love talking. I love talking about things that happen in and around my shop. Whether they be happy things, stressful things things that piss me off. There's a lot of that. (laughs) So thank you again. And if you're listening to this and you live in the Delanderseas building in downtown Fargo, and you've had something weird happen, please come and tell me. I would love to talk about it on a future episode. Because again, I love this building. I love the history of it. I love just what it means to downtown Fargo. And I want to keep that tradition and those stories alive and well. Thank you again. I hope you all have an amazing week and an amazing October. And a very happy Halloween. Thank you.